Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you today. And I'm so happy to talk about this exciting time in life. I remember for myself being a new student at Brigham Young University and how incredible it was for me and the options that came my way. And I just wanna say that this is your time and I hope that you're embracing whatever challenges may come your way over the next months, that you'll embrace them because now is your season. Let me share with you a little story that happened to me shortly after I returned home from my mission. So I was um, a student here at Brigham Young University and going on lots of dates with different people. In fact, I was spending so much time dating that I neglected my male friendships. And towards the end of a fall semester, I was walking home from school one day when I ran into my good friend, Ethan. And Ethan said to me, John, we never see each other. We never hang out. And I said, yeah, Ethan, I'd, lo I'd love to spend time with you. Let's do something together right now. And he said, John, I'd love to spend time with you, but I'm on my way to a leadership club. And then he said, why don't you come with me to the leadership club meeting and we can hang out afterwards? I said, great. So I came right here to this building where I'm filming from right now, the Wilkinson Center, and to this leadership club meeting. It was a student-led club and the woman who was leading the club, she was a student and she was beautiful. She absolutely radiated the spirit and I could feel a connection between me and her. I don't think she felt anything, but I knew that it was a real connection because as I was walking out of the leadership club room without me even saying a word, Ethan looked at me and said, John, I can feel a connection between you and her. And I said, I feel it too. So I said, Ethan, we're gonna have to hang out another time. And I turned right back around and walked into the leadership club. I signed up for the club, got the leadership book. I pretended to be really interested, but I couldn't quite get up enough courage to ask the leader for her phone number. Fortunately, however, uh, thanks to BYU's online directory, I know it's a little creepy, uh, I was able to get her phone number, I called her up and asked her on a date. She said no. I waited for a few more days, called her up, asked her out again. This time she said yes. Well, to make a long story short, we had a magical date. I found out all these things about her. She was totally incredible. And at the end of our date, like a good return missionary, I got a second appointment for the next week. But as I was driving home, I had this sort of uneasy feeling inside. And as I got home and was analyzing things, I'm not saying this to be humble, but I realized I was not good enough for her. She was doing all these incredible things in her life. She was in the leadership club. She had a job. She spent lots of time with her family. I watched a lot of television. I mean, there was this huge gap between me and her. So I was thinking to myself, what should I do? Now, you know that if you have a problem, it's good to pray and read the scriptures. So that's exactly what I did. I prayed and I said, Heavenly Father, I'm really struggling right now. And I explained the whole situation to him. And I said, I'm gonna open up my scriptures and please help me to open up to a verse that's gonna give me the answer that I need. Now, the scriptures aren't a magic eight ball. You can't always just shake them up and get the exact verse that you want, but sometimes I think that does work. So I prayed and then I just whooshed, opened up my scriptures and my scriptures fell open to 35 chapter three, verse 21. Now, a little bit of background on this verse. In 35 chapter three, you've got all the righteous people who have gathered themselves together in one area and all the Gadion robbers are out in the wilderness. And so the righteous people come to their leader, Gid Gadoni, and they say, we want to go attack the Gadion robbers. And 35 chapter 3, verse 21 is Gid Gadoni's response. Now, my question had nothing to do with Gadion robbers. My question was, should I pursue this young lady? I started to read 35 chapter 3, verse 21. But Gid Gadoni saith unto them, the Lord forbid. I was so disappointed. I thought for sure I'd open up and the verse would be like, behold, I say unto you, yea. I know there's verses like that, but I kept on reading. The Lord forbid, for if we should go up against them, the Lord would deliver us into their hands. Therefore, we will prepare ourselves in the center of our lands and we will gather all our armies together. So that's what I, I really felt the Holy Ghost say, John, this is what you need to do. Metaphorically speaking, you need to gather your armies together. You need to make yourself a better person. You are not good enough for her. So I was like, wow, powerful. And then I kept reading the verse. So we will gather all our armies together and we will not go against them, but we will wait until they shall come against us. So I felt like this was really clear. I called up the lady and I canceled our next date because the scripture said, we will not go against them. And then I needed to prepare myself and wait for her to come against me. So over the next four months, I embarked on a rigorous self-improvement program 
and that's probably a discussion for a different day. But over the winter semester, I, I worked hard and I made myself a better person. I still probably wasn't quite as good as she was, but I was a lot better. And I really wanted this opportunity to go on another date with her. But I was kind of fixated on the scripture that said, we will wait until they shall come against us. So the following semester, spring term, I was going to be taking a class and she was the only person I knew who had successfully completed the class. So I didn't want to go up against her. So I just sent her a little email and said, do you have any suggestions for how I could succeed in this class? She did not email me back. She called me and said, would you like to talk about it over lunch? And I thought, she's coming to me. And if you go back to the scripture in 35 chapter 3, verse 21, it concludes, therefore, as the Lord liveth, if we do this, he will deliver them into our hands. And Lonnie and I were married about a year later. So I think there's something powerful here about searching the scriptures. Now, real quick, before we um, go on to this slide, I, I want to make it clear that I am not suggesting that my wife was a Gadiant and robber or anything like that. I know that when Mormon was writing these verses, he was not thinking about my dating life. I think the power comes from opening the scriptures, and it's the scriptures combined with the Holy Ghost that give us the revelation we need. And so throughout this next semester, you're going to have all sorts of conflicts, whether it's with roommates or professors or random people on campus or conflicts within yourself. Remember that one of the most important resources you have is the sacred word of God. And I promise you that as you pray and read your scriptures, you're going to find answers and insight. Let's take a look at a few verses of scripture that talk about searching, not just reading, but the sons of Mosiah, they had success on their missions as they searched the scriptures. Alma said to the Zoramites, ye ought to search the scriptures. Mormon says, if you have the scriptures, search them. And of all the verses, uh, books of scripture that I would encourage you to search, it's the Book of Mormon. Speaking of this great book, President Ezra Tapp Benson said, there is a power in the book which will begin to flow into your lives the moment you begin a serious study of the Book of Mormon. You will find greater power to resist temptation. You will find the power to avoid deception. You will find the power to stay on the straight and narrow path. Now, just uh, for fun, I'm a college professor, so I like to ask uh, little questions. True or false, Joseph Smith taught that we would get nearer to God by studying the Book of Mormon than by any other book. If I were running Instagram giveaways, this would have been the question that I would have asked. Now, my guess is that most people will say true, but it's actually false. That's a trick question. And I hope that your professors don't give you trick questions this semester. But what Joseph Smith actually said is that people will get nearer to God by abiding by the precepts of the Book of Mormon. So it's not just studying the Book of Mormon, it's abiding by the precepts that makes a difference. That's the actual quote from Joseph Smith. And in Doctrine and Covenants, section 84, we read this phrase, the condemnation resteth upon all the children of Zion, and they shall remain under this condemnation until they repent and remember the new covenant, even the Book of Mormon. Now notice this next phrase, not only to say, but to do according to that which I have written. So as we talk about your time, I would encourage you to search the scriptures and act on them. Now let's shift gears and let's talk about tapping into a vision that God has for you in your life. I love these words from Elder Jeffrey R. Holland. He said, I believe that in our own individual ways, God takes us to the grove or the mountain or the temple and there shows us the wonder of what his plan is for us. We may not see it as fully as Moses or Nephi or the brother of Jared did, but we see as much as we need to see in order to know the Lord's will for us. Here's what Elder Richard G. Scott said, and I hope you'll take these words to heart as you're about to start a new semester. You have this fresh new beginning right now. What will you be? What will you become this next semester? Elder Scott said, you need a retreat of peace and quiet where periodically you can ponder and let the Lord establish the direction in your life. Sometime soon, you may benefit from taking this personal inventory. What are my highest priorities of life? 
How do I use my discretionary time? Is some of it consistently used for my highest priorities? Is there anything I know I should not be doing? If so, I will stop now. Think about those three questions. As you embark on this new semester, you have this opportunity to be a different person than you've been before. Maybe in the past you were like this, but now you have a fresh start. What are your highest priorities in your life? How are you using your discretionary time? Are you using it for the purposes that are gonna lead you to where God wants you to go? Is there anything that you know you should not be doing? If so, now is the time to stop those things. Now, before we get too far in your college career, I think this idea of Elder Scott's going on a retreat is so powerful. And letting the Lord, as Elder Scott said, establish that direction in your life. What will God put into your heart? So here's another five questions that you might think about as you go on a retreat at the start of a semester. Five years from now, what do you want to have accomplished with respect to school? What do you hope your family will be like in five years? What skills do you want to develop during your time at BYU? What type of contributions do you want to make to your church and community in the next five years? And what type of person do you want to become? And so I think the first part is to set this long-term vision for what do I want to do and become over the next five years? And then prayerfully consider what will you do this semester to work towards this vision? And these ideas that we're talking about, this is basically what I did in that semester when I didn't see Lonnie between our first and second date. I went on a retreat and I prayed about different ideas that were coming into my heart from the Lord. And I set a plan for what I would do and become over the next couple of years and then created a vision of what God wanted me to be in the following semester. And that really got me on the right track. So again, some questions you could consider asking yourself. Considering the five-year vision I have for myself scholastically, what are a few significant attainable goals that I feel inspired to accomplish this semester? Or considering the five-year vision that I have for my family, what are a few significant attainable goals I feel, and feel inspired to accomplish this semester? And then once you have these semester-based goals, implement your three to four month plan through weekly prioritization and planning. There are gonna be so many opportunities for you to do so many fun things this semester that it is really easy to get distracted from what matters most. And so that's why taking the time to prayerfully plan your week can make a huge influence in your ability to make the very most of this next semester. How will you and I avoid becoming distracted? I think the key is found in this, this next question, which is what will you and I choose not to do? Uh, in fact, I, I love here in Alma chapter seven, this is uh, Alma chapter seven, verses one through seven. And the basic context here is you've got the prophet Alma and he had two major roles. He was the chief judge, which was the highest political office in the land. And he was also the high priest, which was the highest office in the church. And so between these two roles, he wasn't able to, I don't know, put enough time into both of them. So eventually he decided that he needed to give one of them up. We read in Alma chapter 7, he says, as he's visiting the people in the land of Gideon, even now I could not have come had the judgment seat not been given to another. In other words, even though they were both great things, he was the chief judge, high priest, both good things, he did not have enough time for both. He had to decide what to give up. And that's probably going to happen to you this semester. Let's imagine a college freshman. We'll call him Levi. Levi came to BYU because he wants to grow closer to Jesus Christ. That's a key part of why he chose this university. Of course, he has a goal to have a 4.0 GPA, he wants to get a scholarship. He wants to exercise and stay healthy, physically fit. In addition, he hopes to make some money and enjoy some school spirit and activities. Now, it's possible for Levi to accomplish all of these objectives, 
But if he's not careful, he could get distracted by other things. For example, spending so much time on social media or playing random video games or all sorts of other time wasters, including excessively focusing on money or those really crazy late nights. In fact, if Levi's not careful, he'll lose all of the powerful opportunities he has this semester at BYU because of silly distractions. So I think to be like Alma, we just need to carefully decide what will we not do? What will we not purchase? What will we not watch? What activities, digital or otherwise, will we stop or do less frequently? Choosing what we will not do gives us additional time and energy to focus on the things that are most important. So if I can tell you one of the things that for me was most important during my freshman year at Brigham Young University, it was my connection to the BYU 67th Ward. It was my freshman ward, and I still remember the members of my bishopric, Bishop Kuhn, Brother Erickson, Brother Galland, the high counselor, Brother Wilcox, who helped me with some things. My friendships that I made in my BYU ward are life-changing. In fact, they're still with me today. Just this last week, I spent some time with some friends from my BYU ward, having a little reunion and get together. Now, all of us are gonna have different experiences. There might be some clubs that you're involved in that make a huge difference for you. And you're, each one of us is gonna to have to prayerfully decide what it is that we let go of and what will we not do. But I encourage you to give a really high priority to your campus ward, to your BYU ward. Sometimes it's easy to go ward hopping and to not make a deep connection. What I found is that when I put my church responsibilities right at the forefront, along with the other things that I'm trying to juggle, there's enough time for everything. In fact, this idea that there's time for everything if we balance it carefully has been taught by many members of the church, uh, many church leaders. I love this advice from President Nelson. He said, take an inventory of how you spend your time and where you devote your energy. That will tell you where your heart is. Now, take a look at this picture on the screen here. Joseph Smith, you know he's reading James 1.5, reflecting on it again and again. This is a key moment in the restoration. But what if this were replaced by this? Would we have missed the whole coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the restored gospel of Jesus Christ if Joseph Smith had been distracted during his scripture study? You and I know that digital devices can be so wonderful, but also harmful. This study from the Journal of Association for Consumer Research showed that 548 college students took tests that measured their cognitive abilities. Students with cell phones on their desks performed significantly worse than those whose phones were outside the room. Now think about that. The, just the mere presence of a phone on the desk was connected with lower performance. Even worse, Students said that the position of their phones didn't affect them. In other words, the potential for digital distraction did negatively influence those with phones on their desks, and they were not even aware of it. This will negatively impact you in school, but also spiritually. President Ballard said it is important to be still and listen and follow the Spirit. We simply have too many distractions to capture our attention. You cannot connect to the Spirit during the presentation of the sacrament while looking at or sending a message on your smartphone or your tablet. So we each need to think about this as we are focusing on our vision for ourselves. How will we let go of digital distractions? Now, some of you may feel overwhelmed and stressed. You're trying to do so many things and you think, how can I let go of anything? I love this advice from President Eyring. He said, I realize there are some, perhaps many, for whom my urging to capture leisure time cuts like a knife. You feel overwhelmed by the lack of time. You've carried your scriptures all day, but still not found a moment to open them. You will go to a job tomorrow that barely pays enough to keep food on your table and pay your bills. Rather than finding ways to capture leisure time for learning, you are trying to decide what to leave undone. There is another way to look at your problem of crowded time. You can see it as an opportunity to test your faith. The Lord has promised you this. 
Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. That is a true promise. When we put God's purposes first, he will give us miracles. If we pray to know what he would have us do next, he will multiply the effects of what we do in such a way that time seems to be expanded. And then Elder Eyring shares this personal experience. He says, years ago, I was admitted to a graduate program for which I was poorly prepared. He was receiving his doctorate degree at Harvard. He said, on the first day, the professor told us, look at the person on your left and the person on your right. One of the three of you will likely fail. That's an encouraging welcome. I hope none of you will receive that at BYU. President Irene continues, the schedule of classes filled the five weekdays from early until late. Preparations for the next day's classes started excuse me, lasted until nearly midnight, often beyond. And then late on Friday, a major paper was assigned with no way to prepare until the assignment was given and with the paper due at nine o'clock on Saturday night. I can still remember the hours of frantic study and writing those Saturdays. And as the nine o'clock deadline approached, crowds of students would stand around the slot in the wall of the library to cheer as the last desperate student would dash up to throw in his completed paper just before the box inside the building was pulled away from beneath the slot to let the late papers fall into the oblivion of failure. Then the students would go back to their homes and to their rooms for a few hours of celebration before starting preparations for Monday classes. And most of them would study all day on Sunday and late into the night. But for me, there was no party on Saturday and no studying on Sunday. The Lord gave me an opportunity to test his promise. Early in that year, he called me to a church service that took me across the hills of New England from the early hours of Sunday to late in the evening. In the few minutes I could give to preparation on Monday morning before classes, ideas and understanding came to more than match what others gained from a Sunday of study. You can see in President Eyring's life, that he focused on what he would not do. He carefully chose what things he would emphasize and what things he would let go of. I know that as you and I prayerfully decide what will we not do, we'll find blessings flow into our lives. Now, let's talk about one final way that I think (coughs) will benefit each one of us. And that is to take the dare not to compare. And maybe I can... um, Maybe I can start this out just by sharing a little story with you. So when it comes to fixing things around the house, I'm not very handy. And it can be kind of embarrassing at times. I remember on one occasion, our toilet stopped working. And so I was like, all right, I got the plunger and tried to fix the toilet. That didn't work. So I grabbed a snake and shoved it down the toilet. This is a tool, by the way, not the animal. That didn't work. And I was like, well, I guess we'll never be able to use the toilet again. I was, you know, bummed out. I came home from work a day or two later and my wife was rocking the toilet back and forth and she picked it up. I didn't even know you could pick up toilets. So she picked it up, threw it outside and out popped this little jewelry box that one of our kids had shoved in it. So I was, you know, I was kind of embarrassed that I hadn't been able to fix the toilet on my own. And I don't know, a few years went by and I decided it was time for me to build a swing set for my children. I wanted to, uh, you know, just, just really, I don't know, have this great building project. So I went to the store, Toys R Us, bought this kit for building a swing set, and there were 26 steps for building the swing set. And I'm not making this up. The first step took me seven hours. It was one of the worst experiences of my life. It took months and so much help from my brothers-in-law. But finally, the magical day came when the swing set was complete. I was so happy. Kids were swinging, everyone was excited. And as the swing set, um, kids were playing on it, one of my children came up to me and they're like, Dad, we love the swing set, but there's one problem. There's only three monkey bars. And I said, honey, you will love those three monkey bars because I am never building another swing set for you again. Now that magical day that the swing set was completed, that was a Saturday. The day before Friday, I was teaching seminary full time at the at that um, during that year, and we were studying Ether chapter twelve, 
And uh, there's a famous verse, it's Ether chapter 12, verse 27. My guess is that many of you have this verse memorized, or at least parts of it. The Lord's talking with Moroni, and he says, If men come unto me, I will show unto them their weakness. I give unto men weakness that they may be humble. And my grace is sufficient for all men that humble themselves before me. For if they humble themselves before me and have faith in me, then will I make weak things become strong unto them. I love that. Now, what's the context though? Sometimes we just read a great verse. We're like, that verse is awesome. But look at the context. I, Moroni, Moroni is talking to the Lord, says, Lord, the Gentiles will mock at these things, meaning the Book of Mormon, because of our weakness in writing. Lord, thou hast made us that we could write but little because of the awkwardness of our hands. Behold, thou hast not made us mighty in writing like unto the brother of Jared, for thou made us sin that the things which he wrote were mighty, even as thou art. So notice how the brother of Jared was this amazing writer, and Moroni compared himself to him and felt bad. And that's the context in which the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. So on that Friday at seminary, we talked about the dangers of comparison, and I invited all my students to focus over the weekend on not comparing themselves to other people, and they'd report back on Monday how it went. So that was Friday. Saturday, finished the swing set. Sunday, went to church. Monday, I went back to seminary, and I handed out all of these three-by-five cards to the different students and asked them to report on their experience. So they were write down their responses. I collected them all. And later that night, my family and I, we were driving over to my brother-in-law's house for a family home evening. And as we're driving, my wife and I were reading these cards, and I could not believe how many of my seminary students said something like, I compare myself all the time. Or, you know, even though I'm fill in the blank, they were popular, the cheerleader, in drama, captain of the chess club, whatever cool thing they were doing, talk about how they compared themselves to others and it really hurt them. I still remember as I got out of the car thinking to myself, wow, these high school students have a big problem with comparison. So we walked into my brother-in-law's backyard and the first thing I noticed was his swing set. It had five monkey bars. And I thought, I hate my swing set. And then I was like, whoa, wait, like 48 hours ago, I loved my swing set. I cherished it. And now I hated it. And the only difference was the comparison. And I've been like, these teenagers have a hard time with comparison. I realized I had a hard time with comparison. I remember on another occasion shortly thereafter, I was giving a talk at a girls camp with Brad Wilcox. I don't know how many of you have gotten to learn from Brother Wilcox. He's a famous youth speaker. And so we're getting everything set up and he was in the back and I was up front because I was going to speak first. And this young woman, maybe 12, 13 years old, comes up to me and she's holding a camera. And I thought, that is so precious. She wants to get her picture with me. Maybe she read one of my books or something. And she looks at me and she said, are you Brad Wilcox? And I was like, oh, no, that's the other speaker. And she said, oh, and just walked away. And I was like, I am the biggest loser. And then I realized I can't compare myself to Brother Wilcox. I'm not Brad Wilcox. You don't have to compare yourself to anyone else either. We can take the dare not to compare. Even someone amazing like Moroni was discouraged when he compared himself to others. But Jesus Christ said, my grace is sufficient. We don't need to compare ourselves to others. I love these words from President Uchtdorf. He said, the Lord doesn't expect us to work harder than we are able. He doesn't, nor should we, compare our efforts to those of others. Our Heavenly Father asks only that we do the best we can, that we work according to our full capacity, however great or small that may be. One of the opportunities that you'll have at BYU is to attend devotionals. And I encourage you to attend these devotionals. This is a quote from J.B. Haas, Associate Dean of Religion at BYU, from a devotional he gave about a year ago. He said, think of all the questions that bombard us on a daily basis. Did I get picked for a leadership position on my mission? Did I score more points than my rival in the basketball game? Did I get the highest score on the test in my class? Did I play more flawlessly in my addition than did everyone else? Did my witty comment in Sunday school make more people laugh than my roommate's comment did? If I glance over at the treadmill next to mine, will I find that I am running at a faster pace and on and on and on? 
these constantly nipping questions are all about me, 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 and it's exhausting. Doesn't it sound freeing and liberating to think less about ourselves? To not be thinking about ourselves at all? If we can naturally think of others instead of ourselves, none of this, not flattery, not worry about where we measure up, not insecurities fueled by the lack of retweets will stick to us. Jesus is the answer. His teachings, his example, and especially his power to effect this change in our heart. I love what Elder Holland said. Jesus still stands triumphant over death. Although he stands on wounded feet, he still extends unending grace, although he extends it with pierced palms and scarred wrists. Notice how in this quote, Elder Holland emphasizes the wounded Christ, the wounds that he received in his crucifixion. A lot of times we focus on the living Christ, and of course, we believe in the living Christ. Recently, in my personal studies, I've been focused on lessons that can be learned from the crucified Christ, from Jesus on the cross. And I know that's an image that some of us don't like to think about. But did you know that the Savior has actually commanded us to view his crucifixion wounds? In Doctrine and Covenants section 6, verse 36, the Savior said, Look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. Now that's a verse that a lot of us know. What about the very next verse? So he says, look unto me in every thought, doubt not, fear not. Behold, meaning fix your eyes upon the wounds in my side and my hands and in my feet. I believe that there's a great power that can come into our lives when we think and contemplate about the pain that Jesus Christ experienced on the cross because that suffering was a manifestation of his love. Remember that Jesus Christ himself said, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ personally defined his greatest act of love for us as his death on the cross. And so as we spend some time reflecting and thinking about the Savior's sacrifice, we will feel a great connection with him. In fact, I I like to think about the Savior on the cross as the loving Christ, because that's where he told us was his greatest act of love. We can worship both the living Christ and the loving Christ and find great joy in our lives as we do so and a greater connection with our Savior. I love these words from Elder Rasband. Jesus Christ is the answer. Ultimately, the problems and struggles that we have, whether in this life or the next, will find resolution through him. And so as we conclude, I invite you to think carefully about what will you do as a result of the things that we've talked about today. I've had a lot of fun talking with you, and I hope that you've had fun as well. But at the end, remember about abiding by the precepts. It's not just reading the scriptures, it's doing something with them that makes the difference. In a similar way, if we've had tons of fun together, shared a few good stories and scripture verses, but we don't do anything in our lives, this time was a waste. And so I'd invite you to search the scriptures and act on them, to tap into God's vision for your life, to prayerfully consider what will you not do. And I invite you to take the dare not to compare. In conclusion, I want to testify to you that I know Jesus Christ lives. His grace really is sufficient. Jesus is enough. You're going to have so many opportunities this semester to study probably some general education courses that you're taking. Maybe you're starting into some major courses. But one thing I would invite you to consider is amidst all the amazing things you'll be studying, will you set aside some time to have a focused study on Jesus Christ? Make a plan for how you will personally connect more fully with him, what things you will study And I know that as we make the effort to come closer to Jesus Christ, he makes the effort to come closer to us. For he has said, draw near unto me, and I will draw near unto you. I witness to you of the living reality of the resurrected Jesus Christ. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.